Welcome back to another cube draft. Uh, I apologize for probably pretty shoddy quality, um, but I am just using my laptop mic because I was too lazy to get my regular mic, so I apologize. But alas, uh, this is kind of a difficult pack. It's like Snapcaster versus double. It's probably just Snapcaster, right? All right, I guess it's not that difficult. Yeah, because I mean, like the mana dorks are really powerful, really strong picks, but if you take one, the other one's going to get taken, and you'll just get kind of cut there. So I'll go with the Snapcaster. Shivan Reef, Counterspell, Sleight of Hand, Scour Possibilities, Truth or Tale. Alright, so those are my blue options, basically. I think that Shivan Reef is really good, but so is Counterspell. Yeah, it's hard to pass up a hard counter format that doesn't have a ton. Alright, Glacial Fortress... Yeah, I feel like it's a pretty clear glacial fortress here. These cards are too big. Can you make them smaller? They're enormous. Nope. Alright, well, alas. So yeah, the other pack had like some counter spells and cantrips in them. There's a lot more redundancy for those than there are lands. So uh, I went for the lands. I'm gonna quit uh, Discord because it needs to eat up a lot of energy. So yeah, in general, I mean, like, I was kind of trying not to be in control tonight, because I played control last night in a draft with some friends, but, um, you know, when the cards just give you the good stuff, it's not that much you can do. Now, granted, I could end up in, like, tempo. I could grab this Mardu Strike Leader and play, like, an Esper Tempo list, but I think Worldly Council is a little bit safer. Um, yeah. There's like Lightning Strike too, or Go for the Throat, which are also fine. Strike Leader is really good. If it wheels, then I know that like some sort of, you know, uh, tempo or aggro deck is open. So, but I'll take the Worldly Council for now. Like we know we're playing this and this. We don't know about the other stuff yet. We could end up like blue black. Right, well, Colonnade is a really good pickup if we want to be blue white. And that, like, puts us in double blue white fixing, which is relatively nice. Colonnade's a new addition to my cube. Um, for a while, it was excluded because it does technically make a gold um, creature. This is a pack where you've got. Curator of Mysteries and Elspeth. I mean, I think it's a very clear Elspeth, but I think it's worth talking about Curator of Mysteries because um, it's just a really solid card that um, I'm hoping to wheel here. That's basically what I'm thinking about. Is like I'm, I want to wheel Banishing Light or Curator of Mysteries, but Elspeth is just really potent. It's really hard to pass that up. Alright, Tundra. It's easy. I mean,. I shouldn't be seeing a pack one pick seven tundra. I don't. I don't understand. I'm gonna take battlefield forge. Maybe we splash red. Yeah, I don't. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand how we're getting. You know, I, like this happened to me last night too. Where I just like passed all lands. It's like this doesn't make sense. That's not how this is supposed to work. Uh, I'll take bone crusher giant. That card's fine. Um, and if we end up in more of a tempo-y style deck, which we still could, um, you know, more like Just Guide Tempo, that could be a reasonable inclusion, right? Like, if we do something like this. Or Fixie would have to be really tight, but hey, we're playing against, uh, playing against drafters who like to pass lands, so it's possible. Alright, Scour All Possibilities, fine. Yeah, I'm just putting this Bone Crusher Giant up here so that my brain doesn't forget that I have one. Because um, it's still like a pretty safe, pretty fine um, tempo card. And like if I end up in tempo, like it's just a reminder that tempo is an option so that I don't like forget. I think Caves of Coils is correct here. I don't think Dismissive Pyromancer is like super good in tempo or anything, so I'll just go with the land. Um, Seal of Fire is fine. Probably not splashing for it. Let's take away the equipment. It's the one I don't like the most. 
Crater Maker, I guess, is fine. Crater is fine. Alright, I mean, it looks like Mono Red would be open at this point if I wanted to transition. Um, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense. One, two, three, four, five cards. I don't know, bannings like blue white, which looks very, very open. Alright, yeah, no. We're playing blue white. <sighs> Pardon me. I mean, Goblin Guy's good, but it's not Jace the Mind Sculptor good. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, Growth Chamber Guardian seems bad when it can't get more copies. Um, the reason I said additive distraction or response is just that um, that text doesn't really matter. It's basically like the green equivalent of. Um, it's like the green equivalent of student warfare, right? Like it's a. It's a two mana bear that grows into a four four, right? And so, um, sure, it's a mana sink and it's like tempo loss whenever you. Um, so I'm just kind of like clicking through some of this stuff. Like those were obviously take the flood of strand. Obviously take the wrath of god here. So Growth Chamber Guardian is just a 2-mana two 2-2, two, two, which is fine against aggro, and then it grows into a 4-4, four, four, which is still fine against aggro, and like pressures your control opponent and forces them to spend mana on your single 2-mana threat, which they don't really want to be doing. So, um, yeah, that's basically the way I think about that. Uh, telling Time over Omen, maybe. They're close, but I like the instant speed more. What I like about Omen is it, it does like Shuffle, which is like a big game. We'll just put this in the board. We're definitely playing control now. We don't have to be. I mean, Wrath of God was like pretty. It was a pick that took me into control, but I don't have to be in control right now. Even though I've seen four of the five blue white duels. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of taking domestication. I mean, Scrubland is good though, too. We do know that there's a Wrath in this pack, so like maybe we take this just to hedge. Or if we end up Esper. That seems fine. I like that as a safer pick. Domestication isn't like a super high pick. It's quite good against mid-range. Um, but like I need to hedge for like being able to have a playable deck at the end of this. So one, two. I only have two Cantrips, oh, three cantrips, got all possibilities. Gotta learn to read me. Gotta learn to read, yeah, so, yeah, we're up to three cantrips right now. Um, we have two win cons, two wraths. Like, we're in a pretty healthy position for just, like, a solid blue-white control deck. Um, I would love to see, like, a new Yanling or, like, something along those lines. It's pretty reasonable. None of these is, like, really great. Like, Oust is fine spot removal. Uh, pick seven. So we'll see one card from this. It's not going to be oust, so like that's not going to be the last card in this pack. So if we want the oust, we should take it. But if we think that we're going to splash black at all, I really like taking the uh, watery grave. Um, so I think that's like a really tight uh, decision. Nagging thoughts is like a really weak counter or um, uh, cantrip. So not terribly interested in it. I'll go with Watery Grave here. I still have time to pick up the spot removal. Alright, uh, Prison Realm versus Impulse. Impulse is a really, really strong uh, cantrip. But Prison Realm does offer me Planeswalker removal, which can be really, really hard to get. So I'm going to go with that. Um, we're playing that card. We're definitely playing Condescend. That's great. Alright, Rune Snag is good. It's not a one mana spell. You can't cast it. I mean, you can cast it for one. It just doesn't do it. It's just one mana scry to it, which I guess is fine. One mana, you show your opponent that you can have a cantrip and you scry to it. Alright, like, I'll take a Stormfront Pegasus, I guess, here. I can also take Gideon's Lawkeeper, it's better against mid-range. Oh god, I'm sorry. I could take Gideon's Lawkeeper because it's better against mid-range, that would be fine. Sure. It's also just like not bad against aggro, like when you bring it out of the board, because it just, um, it's able to actually, 
um, tap down their, you know, one, two drops or whatever. It slows down their clock. All right, strategic planning is not my favorite cantrip, but it's fine. I'll take judgment, I guess. Well, we have three win cons, too. I forgot we had colonnade. Um, all right. All right. Kind of like Supreme Well here, that card's pretty decent. What I like about it is it's instant speed. It's still a cantrip. Even though it costs three, like you're less likely to hit your third land before you cast your cantrip, but it's also a counter spell, which um, is really nice. It's just a modal spell. It's just really solid, flexible inclusion. Alright, Remand, getting into the trials. Getting into the trials is kind of like pseudo removal. Command is fine. Kind of like Gideon here. It could be wrong though. I just feel a little bit uh, threat light, I guess. And so I feel like the pressure to like pick this up. Sure. Alright, Council's Judgment is fine. Beds of Disloyalty is fine. Glyph Keeper is also fine, but I'm not like. I'm not like super hype on it. Yeah, sure, Council Judge, that's fine. Cool. Alright. Jace World of Mysteries, I like a fair bit. Miscalc is also really good. Um, but we do have like a lot of two CMC counters already. So I'll just go with Jace. Play into more of like a tap out control where we've got like a lot of threat density now. Where we didn't have it really before. <laughs> Uh, Sunlance is decent. Uh, I could take Sunlance or I could take Misty Rainforest. I'm kind of leaning toward Rainforest, um, just to have better fixing. I like to consistently cast my spells, but we have like a lot of cantrips so far. We've got one, two, three, four, five, five and a half. So we are pretty likely to hit our correct lands, but like, you know, fixing is not going to be that bad. I guess I can take Sunlance. Which one's more likely to wheel? I guess some is more likely to wheel. I'll take the Mystery Reinforce. We don't really need... Really removal that much. I mean, you do, but, like, I don't know. We're making up for it with, like, Wraths, I think, for the most part. Which makes us weaker to aggro, notably. I mean, we can run Fork Bolt if we want to. Battlefield Forge. I, mean, I guess we don't really have great fixing for it. We could take Cast Down if we wanted to, just to have more early interaction. I'll take the Grasp of Fate, though. Just having three ways of removing Planeswalkers and what seems like a draft for people being a little bit greedier. And here we're kind of rewarded. We get the Shattered Sky, um, so we have a, an additional Wrath. Oh, fine. Finale of Glory is really, really good. Alright, Chiver Passability Wield. And now our deck is like pretty pretty well coming together. I think the most annoying of these for me is probably Vengevine. Vengevine or Beast Attack. I'll go with Vengevine. Oh sick, Hollow Fountain Wield. We could take Threads of Disloyalty, but it's like really good um, against aggro. Not like incredible, but it's like it's a good card. But I'm just gonna take the Hollow Fountain and just like have a really nice mana base. You know, just like really like being able to cast my spells and like six lands seems to be in like that healthy zone. I guess we're a little bit light on playables, aren't we? Hmm. Maybe. Yeah, 28 minus 6 leaves us with... I wasn't really looking at that. Whoops. Um... Yeah, that was, that was kind of a mess up on my part. I guess I could have taken threads there. I mean, the reality is, is I shouldn't really be getting, you know, 11 lands. That's the reality. Okay, Volcanic Island, sure. Alright, so it looks like we're going to splash red, just to bring us up to... Uh, Enough playables. We've got Seal of Fire, Absence Judgment. 33 minus 9 is 24. 
I can safely run an additional spell here. Just run Bone Crusher Giant. Which is like fine. I don't think we really need uh, any additional mountains for this deck. So I'll just go ahead and say suggest lands. I don't really think we need those. Yeah, I think we can go to four islands. Like, that's definitely our predominant mana source. It's what we need the most early on. So... And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight white sources. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So yeah, I mean, I guess we can we can do three and three split. All right, sure. Seems fine. So we got three wraths. We got some of the better planeswalkers for the deck. We won the die rolls. So that's that's nice. That's always a good place to start. Wait, how many lands are there? Fifteen. I think that's about right. Uh, this is fine. It's not great, but it's it's acceptable. All right, playing against aggro, so this should go poorly. Did not realize that card under tapped. Shows what happens when you don't read. I'll just play a, a island here. I mean, we've got double wrath here, so I'm like not terribly concerned. Okay. All right, so we're gonna say four here. Ouch! My opponent gets a clone of the Bloodforged Axe, and then we're just going to Supreme Well. Let's see what we get. Alright, Counterspell, Bone Crusher Giant. Bone Crusher Giant could be okay, but the problem is it doesn't kill this Eternal Taskmaster. I'm just going to go with Counterspell. I think that's fine as a follow-up to any of these Wraths as well, which is a nice benefit. Alright, sure, he can draw a card. So he's considering whether or not I wanted to cast this card here, um, just to kill his one threat. But I think the reality is I need to. Um, and basically the reason I'm doing this is because now he's got to spend... Um, he's got to spend a resource. Like, he, now he has to actually use resources to commit things to the board. So, um, that was kind of my logic there. Now, granted, I can't really use my counter spells effectively, which kind of blows, so... Okay. I'm gonna take, like, six here, I guess, to just, like, double equips. Ugh. Yeah, I mean, Bloodforge Battle Axe is like one of those cards which is like really, really good against control. Yeah, okay. This so is not gonna. Didn't double equip, so he's gonna commit something else post. Okay. Now I kept like a all lander, which was obviously not optimal against aggro.
I will counter that. Okay. And, yep. Yeah. So, I'll just grab a Tundra here. And, oh, Jace, that's pretty decent. I'm just going to bounce that guy. I'm okay with discarding a card. It's fine. This buys me a lot of time. I'm talking about a lot of time here. So if like you can't answer this immediately, I just And this also means that like he's gonna waste a lot of tempo if he like plays it again and then equips or something the following turn, so Okay, so we drew Omen for turn. I think it's right to just zero Jace first. Alright, so Strat Plane, Planes, Grasp of Fate. I think that I just want the uh, Grasp of Fate here. Um, okay, now I can... If I want to, I can Grasp of Fate the this guy. That seems like pretty reasonable. Okay, so what I want to do is um, I want to cast Omen. That's even better. So I want to draw that, yeah. And I want to go one. Okay, any day now you will tap. Yeah, my computer's really mad that I'm making it record, but whatever. YOLO. Okay. Alright, so we're going to J0 here. You know that we have strap planning, but the other two cards we don't know. Okay, Snapcaster and Wrath of God, those are both very strong. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put Wrath of God back here. Um, I think my game plan is to just wrath the board with Fumigate. Um, and then probably Snapcaster Fumigate again after, so um, it's kind of nice. Alright, I'll take it. Um, let's take another island here. So sure, um, he ended up taking away my... Alright, that works. Yeah, it's pretty good. I get to cast this for like, I don't know, too much. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's a two turn clock. Uh, and I can bounce and remove most threats here, so. And if he like commits a lot to the board here, I can just Snapcaster and then cast Fumigate. Um, and I get to gain the life off of my Snapcaster, which is kind of nice too. So, feeling like I'm in a comfy position. Okay, that's fine. Well, we should technically uh, brainstorm first, I guess.
Look at that. Found another land. Glad I did that now. Okay, so we're just going to fetch for a planes here and uh, play finale for a billion. I think it's actually seven, but. Okay, while he's thinking, I'm going to go ahead and start a new recording, give my computer a break. All right. So we're back online. Uh, while you were gone, he cast a Murderous Rider, well, the swift end half of Murderous Rider to kill one of my guys. Um, which was fine. Uh, yeah. And now I will get to uh, cast out. Okay. Sure. Okay, so Liliana minus. Um, you could get Taskmaster, Spectre, or Order of Midnight. I feel like Taskmaster is the best. I can't block. So now the question is, do I buff two of my guys? Oh wait, wait, no, no, no! I can't do that, can I? I have to, I have to kill this because he can equip one, two, three. That's sneaky, opponent. It's really sneaky of you. Um, so I have to kill it. So eight plus eight, 16. Oh, I guess I had lethal, whoops. Yeah, I missed lethal there. I wasn't thinking about, um, yeah, I wasn't thinking about that interaction. That's all right though. I was loose, but like, I mean, his outs to win here are so slim, so, so slim. Technically, since I didn't actually kill him last turn, I didn't have to show him the Elspeth. If I had played properly, showing him the Elspeth would have been fine because I would have um, won that turn, and that's that's fine to give them the information and, and win on the spot. But uh, yeah, given that I messed up, showing them Elspeth was also a mistake, but it wouldn't have been a mistake had I not made a mistake. <laughs> okay. Nah, I'll just make sure I kill him. Snapcaster, Addison's Judgment. Okay, so um, unfortunately between game one and two, uh, my QuickTime recorder um, was unable to save the replay that I, or the um, the recording that I had made. So now I have to go back in and record the replay. Uh, from Cockatrice, so um, there's a couple things that will be different here. One, you'll see my opponent's hand, and uh, I will try to comment on that as well. Uh, I'll try to talk from what my game, my mindset was in game, as well as um, what I think my opponent could have maybe done better, um, both in potentially deck construction and drafting, uh, as well as in terms of their gameplay. So we will gain some insight in terms of you know what my opponent's game plan was and how they executed it and what you know, maybe led to a win or victory in uh, in my favor, or in their favor, rather. Well, either way, however you want to explain that. Um, 
but what you lose is my sideboard strategy. Um, to my knowledge, I brought in cheaper things. I boarded out counter spells, if I remember right. Um, it's been a couple days now, but um, I boarded out the counter spells because I was playing against an aggro deck, and they generally can get in under your counter spells. And by the time that you're trying to respond with counter spells, they're often just less useful. So instead, I boarded in um, some more of the aggro cards that I had drafted along the way, things like Ancestral Blade and Herald of Anapenza, I think, and then some other like miscellaneous, right, like two ones and things like that, just to clog up the board earlier. So, uh, but anyway, with all that said, let's jump into the match and um, see how it went. Oh, I'll also be pausing throughout, kind of, maybe, because there are more things to analyze whenever you have two. Okay, so this is my hand. Uh, looks like I've got two... So I've got two Wraths. I've got a uh, Cantrip. Oh, no, what is this? This is terrible. I need the card. In. There we go. That's what I wanted. No, this is really nice. That's massive. Okay, so uh, it looks like I've got two... Rats. I've got Bone Crusher Giant, which it won't show, but um, I think most of us know what that card does. Uh, strategic Planning, which is just a cantrip, and then I've got three lands, uh, all my fixing. I've got double colors and all my fixing. So that's a really great start. Um, so I'm pretty happy with the way that, that that looks. Now, interestingly, right, we get a look at how my opponent chose to mulligan and what they chose to keep. So this hand looks really bad to me. They've got Vault Scourge and... Bloodforge Battleaxe, and that's kind of their whole hand. Um, I mean, they got Bitter Blossom, which is really hard for me to beat, but this is a really high risk keep if they choose to keep it. And they're on the play, too, so, you know, they have a lesser chance of drawing second land. And they chose to keep that. That's, that is not a hand I would have kept because uh, you basically just have Vault Scourge. And Bloodforge Battleaxe, which you can't even equip because you don't have enough mana. Uh, yeah, I'll just play a tap, let it pass. I drew Grasp of Fate. Um, and my opponent lucked into a second land. Um, but I drew, I drew Grasp of Fate, which is um, reasonably good against uh, Bitter Blossom. In my brain, what I'm thinking about is. Um, my game plan right now is cast strategic planning, try to find another land so that I can set up Wrath into Grasp of Fate, some sort of threat. Now that the Bitter Blossom is played, I'm thinking about how Grasp of Fate is a potential answer to that, but I'm also thinking about how Bitter Blossom can and is likely to actually reduce my opponent's 1%. I'm going to slow this down because this is going a little bit too fast. So part of what I'm thinking about is, okay, Bitter Blossom is something that can kill me, but I do have that Fumigate in my hand, um, so I can gain a lot of life off of, you know, killing a large swath of creatures while my opponent is forced to continue to lose life to Bitter Blossom. Given that I'm the control deck, that life loss is going to be more relevant in the game. Um, but also, you know, the my opponent's ability to not commit more threats to the board other than Bitter Blossom is another thing, so he's going to be able to gain some card advantage off of that. So Bitter Blossom is one of those cards that is kind of interesting in the uh, control versus, like, aggro matchup um, in that it creates this um, kind of paradox of I do want my opponent to lose life and since I can outgrind them even with this card advantage engine um, there's some of me that doesn't mind that being there that much but then on the flip side you know I do also want to not have to like I don't want to let my opponent gain card advantage because then they're able to leverage tempo a little bit better by, you know, not committing as much to the board and forcing wrath in places where I wouldn't want to uh, necessarily wrath the board or something like that, right? So there's there's definitely a lot of things going on with that card. Bitter Blossom is one of those cards that is very challenging for control to beat because of this um, paradigm and because it's hard to remove generally. And so I am in a position of relative luck where I do have a removal spell for that card. Um, but yeah, so uh, this is just me kind of thinking a lot about how those those cards interact and, and um, yeah. But in my brain I'm thinking, okay, I have the Fumigate, I can let this kind of sit a little bit longer and force my opponent to uh, do something else if they actually want to kill me because I'm not going to die to Bitter Blossom Beats here. I have Phobie's Mouth Life Gain, I've got, you know, lots of removal and things like that in my hands. So I'm, I'm okay and I can deal with the Bitter Blossom when I need to. Uh, right now, I don't need to. So anyway, 
that's kind of what's going in my head. I drew the worldly council this turn, by the way, and that's a better cantrip than strategic planning right now because it's instant speed. So instead of casting my strategic planning at sorcery speed and having less information on what I'm going to potentially bin forever, I'm going to cast the worldly council. So. I know I'm kind of talking through this really fast, and it's because now that I have some space away from the game, um, I have one both a better sense of clairvoyance, I have less attachment to what's actually happening in the game. Um, but two, because I can see my opponent's hand, I can also understand what they're going, they're, they're dealing with, right? So my opponent didn't draw a land this turn, they can't cast Unexpectedly Absent, they can't cast Ophiomancer, um, and they can't cast either of the Lilianas, which are actually both very good against me. So um, here I'm going to cast Worldly Council. It doesn't show which options there were, if I remember right, it was three lands. Um, so I took the Tundra, I think. But I could be wrong on that, and um, it may have been like two lands and some spell that I couldn't cast yet. Um, but Tundra being like in my brain already, I was saying before that my brain space is I need to find lands so that I can cast my rafts and then stabilize. Right, my rafts are going to allow me to stabilize in this game and bring me to the late game. So really, I just need the mana to be able to do that. And I have good fixing, I still have a large quantity of mana. Now, of course, after I cast my cantrip, I do another land. Um, but that's going to take me to that Fumigate, which I want anyway. So now that when I cast my strategic planning, I can potentially bin some lands and find some other cards, right? So, And that's kind of the beauty of cantrips in terms of um, what they allow you to do in terms of um, deck building and in terms of... Uh, how your actual games play out. You have a lot more agency when you have a um, when you have a cantrip dense deck. Now here, what I'm considering is, do I want to actually grasp with faith this bitter blossom? That's why that turn took a little bit longer because in my brain, I am considering. Okay, bitter blossom is a relatively challenging card to deal with. I could also potentially exile that blood force battle axe. Right, battle axe, as we saw in the first game, is pretty difficult for me to deal with it's going to get on this false scourge, which is going to help him counteract that Bitter Blossom. Right now he's already counteracting the Bitter Blossom life loss, but it's going to allow him to do that even more, um, which I don't want. Um, and if I exiled, oh pardon me, um, if I had exiled the Bloodforged Battle, Ax, Bloodforged Battle Axe, he wouldn't have the ability to clone it this turn, right? I won't have another ability, I won't have another situation where I can actually just hard remove the card and it won't be able to clone itself. So like, if he attaches it this turn, or cooks it this turn, and swings and hits me, then I don't bone crusher in response, which is another thing, right? That's the other consideration. I'm going to get to that. So, um, if he attaches Bloodforge Battle Axe to Vault Scourge, and this is my main consideration here. After after all this stuff goes on, right? Um, then I can prevent the cloning of this, but this is my only real turn to actually just get rid of Bloodforge Battle Axe without um, my opponent being able to clone it, except for Bone Crusher Giant, right? So I can cast the stomp half of Bone Crusher Giant to kill the Vault Scourge in response to the equip. This will prevent his uh, Vault Scourge from one, gaining life, and two, the Bloodforge Battle Axe from cloning itself. And it also sets my opponent back way, like way back on tempo, which is a huge gain for me. Um, this means that I probably don't have to wrath this soon. This means that next turn I can probably spend my turn using strategic planning or casting maybe Bone Crusher Giant if I feel like I should um, try to leverage some pressure. I that may be correct. It may not be correct. You know, it depends. Um, but those are the things I'm considering, and that's that's why my turn took so long. I was just considering should I kill this False Scourge, or I mean, should I kill Bitter Blossom? Should I kill Blood Forge Battle Axe? Is my opponent going to draw another land? If they do, what are they going to play? And if they don't, are they more likely to equip the Bloodforge Battle Axe? So what I ended up going with is they're probably not very likely to draw another land here because um, they're on aggro and they didn't see a land last turn. And so that calculation is based on they should be running less lands, right? They should be running less lands because they're aggro. Like I'm even on 15 lands in my deck. So they should be running on like 14 ish, depending on how good their fixing is. Um, so they're not super likely to see another land. And um, if they do, I can likely still, like if they do, then I get more information before I cast my wraths, right? Um, and if they don't, then I get to leverage a huge tempo advantage by, you know, 
taking away their attack. Granted, that tempo advantage isn't great since they weren't going to do anything else with that mana, um, but it does mean that they essentially wasted the mana of that turn because they weren't able to actually get the effect of Bloodport Battle Axe. So um, I kind of went with Stomp. And, you know, thinking about it now, that tempo advantage isn't really relevant because they weren't going to be able to cast this Elspeth Knight Errant that they drew, right? So, um, and maybe this is actually more of a mid-range deck than an aggro deck now that I look at it a little bit more deeply. It's like a mid-range deck that happens to run one-ups, I think. And so um, that means that when I revisit my cube data that I can relabel it. But anyway, um, you know, that was kind of the, there we go, now, now I can make a token because it's not in my hand anymore, so we can actually see the card. But um, those are the kind of things that was weighing in my head. And um, But I mean, okay, so pause, I guess. Um, yeah, so I guess what I was saying before about tempo is still relevant if we didn't know my opponent's hand. If I didn't know my opponent's hand and I didn't know that they had all things that they cannot cast, then when they equip the Boneforge Battle Axe, or Bloodforge Battle Axe, then it actually is relevant that it dies and they don't get to leverage tempo. So I think that's more what I was thinking about, and it gets a little bit convoluted as I can actually see my opponent's hand here. Um, yeah, because that's, that's kind of what my mentality was. So I think that argument still makes sense. Um, but knowing my opponent's hand, it wasn't really relevant. But I think it was overall probably the correct way. Um, kind of looking back at it. Alright, so I drew another land here. That's not good. Um, we're at a point where we just don't need more lands. But I get to cast a Strat Planning here. Or it looks like I'm casting uh, Grasp of Fate. Alright, so I did choose that Bitter Blossom was threatening enough to where I didn't want it to take over the game. And I think that makes sense, right? This is going to force my opponent to play into my Wraths, and since they are stuck on lands, this is an opportunity for me to um, use my Wraths very effectively to control the way the game goes, right? So, okay, sure, now my opponent equips, they're going to make another uh, Battle Axe. But now in my brain I'm thinking, okay, I could potentially, oh god, <sighs> sorry. So I can potentially wrath this board. Um, I kind of want to do that at some point, just because this Jace, I do kind of want to win the game. So yeah, just fumigate, gain two life, and force you to have something to actually make that Bloodforge Battle Axe you know, relevant. Now my opponent draws the land for the Banishing Light, and they'll get their uh, Bitter Blossom back. So yeah, I mean, that's what's really nice about this is that uh, my opponent actually gets to use their removal, which isn't very good against control in general, um, but they get to use it to actually get back a like really great threat, which like sucks for me, but I think that that's like, ultimately like pretty reasonable um, game interaction. I like to see those kinds of things happen. Um, but yeah, here I can just cast my Gideon and... Uh, Oh, I choose to cast Jace. I think either is fine. Okay, so here what I'm trying to do is maximize my spell efficiency. So I'm going to go Jace into Strat Planning, which makes sense. Both because they feed into each other, right? Strat Planning is going to go three cards deep and uh, potentially put me closer to a Jace victory since Jace can win the game in his Laboratory Maniac mode, which is kind of like a reasonable win condition here. Um, but yeah, Strat Planning. I don't know what I get to see here. Oh, well, I guess I will get to see, because I'll bin the two things. So Snapcaster Mage I took. That makes a lot of sense. And I binned Omen. And Gideon's Lockkeeper. Yeah. That makes sense. You know, Snapcaster is super good here. It's going to allow me to double up on Wraths. It's going to allow me to... Uh, which also means I get a gain more life with Fumigate, so it, it pretty much puts this game into an unwinnable position for my opponent for the most part. Um, at least that's kind of what I'm thinking in my brain. Alright, Elspeth. Makes sense. Um, you know, this is this doubles 
how many Bitter Blossoms he gets to Bitter Blossom each turn, um, if he wants to make tokens each turn, and it also means that um, he can like buff his token. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to probably gonna draw first with Jace, if I'm smart. That's what I should do. So mill my opponent, draw a card. Um, and the reason I'm milling my opponent, even though he's on black-white and could potentially have some graveyard utility, I don't know about the Liliana in his hand. Um, so the reason I'm milling my opponent, though, is because um, you know I, I could mill something that I would actually want to cast, and if I lose the Jace, I'm not going to be very happy about um, having binned things. So um, here, I guess I was considering playing Bone Crusher Giant. But I think instead I rescind my tapping and uh, play Gain of the Trials, which is like, you know. It's a pretty casual environment, so. Um, even though, I mean, like. Yeah, I could have taken another life to cast a Gideon. I don't think it would really matter. But basically, here, yeah, I just emblem Gideon, um, which, you know, makes sense. I'm not currently. My Gideon isn't being threatened. There's nothing really for me to target. Um, and this is going to allow me to potentially attack with my Gideon um, to kill the Elspeth, depending on what I draw. Also, depending on how my opponent plays now. My opponent drew Order of Midnight. So you can get back a creature now. They've got two ways. Uh, pardon me. Um, they've got two ways of recurring things from the graveyard right now. they got Liliana of uh, the Last Hope and Order of Midnight, which you can't read, but the one half of it is return something from the graveyard to your hand. A creature. Looks like my opponent is going to play Liliana of the Veil, vale, if I remember the game correctly. Um... Which is probably their best, you know, choice against me in particular, um, and it means that you know my um, <clears throat> my getting an attack is going to be a little bit more a little bit more limited, right? Alright, so now I can go Snapcaster, Scatter the Winds, attack with Gideon to kill Elspeth with the Seal of Fire, and then I lose Telling Time to the Liliana, which is, like, fine. Um, but I do prevent the, uh, the double uptick, basically, each turn. Looks like that's the line I'm going for. Actually, I can cast Fumigate, yeah, so I gain three life. Sorry, I miscounted my mana. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty good. I gained three life, I killed their whole board, and then I also get to kill Elspeth. Um, I mean, I still have to deal with this uh, Bitter Blossom, and now I have Wrath three times, which is not great. But, you know, I'm halfway through my deck, more than halfway through my deck. Um, and I know that in my brain I was thinking about casting this cantrip next turn to get back ahead on card advantage, but I forgot that I was going to lose my cantrip to... Um, to Liliana. I'm also trying to kind of push for uh, ult and keep Jace around, which is like super greedy. Right, so my brain, if I can get Jace to um, a position in which he can actually ult, um, that's a pretty big gain. So I'm kind of playing to ult plus keep Jace on the board so that I can just win with his his win condition text. Because there is a world in which I try to draw too many cards and then I can't beat my opponent before they die. So uh, I don't really just want to like cash him in without being able to win the game with his win the game clause. That is, that is something that can happen in limited. It's actually you just don't get there. Okay. 
My opponent plays Liana. I don't really care about that until she gets to the point where she's going to maybe ult. So. Drew land. That's not a very good draw. I uptake Gideon. Which makes sense. Um, this is protecting him from like Bloodforge Battle Axe since I don't really know what I... Uh, yeah, since double equip right now could kill my Gideon. If I were to attack and try to kill... I mean, I guess I could kill the Liliana, the smaller Liliana, but I can't kill the big one, which is the one I actually care about. So, um... I don't really know about this uh, unexpected, unexpectedly absent that's in his hand, so it's just easier to not... This is the point of the game where I, I basically have established control, but it's a matter of, like, my opponent could potentially ult that Liliana, my opponent could potentially outgrind me with Bitter Blossom, and so they're staying in the game. Um, which, like, I respect. I think that's probably correct. Um, you forced me to sack the Bone Crusher Giant there instead of discard. Uh, which is kind of interesting because he could have just, uh, I mean, I guess this protects his Lilianas because they could attack next turn and try to kill them off. It's a really long turn. My opponent's really like thinking, I guess, about unexpectedly absent, whether or not they want to cast it, how they want to use their Order of Midnight slash Ultra Fate. Um, obviously you guys probably won't see this is a very long turn because I'll just edit it out um, but yeah my opponent was kind of deep in the tank there so he's going to get back Eternal Taskmaster so he's going to get this back in order to try to get back Gravecrawler and utilize his graveyard more effectively also to punish me for uh, my greed kind of with Jace all right, so Council's Judgment is pretty good here. Um, I have a lot of targets, right? So I'm going to pause here because there's uh, a lot to consider. Gonna, I don't know how long my turn lasts because I could be thinking a little bit faster about this kind of stuff. So I could, at this point, kill Bitter Blossom, right? Um, that would allow me to... What does that do? That allows me to not have to Wrath as much, which is going to be challenging given that I've already used three Wraths and I only have one more. Um, I could get rid of Liliana of the Veil, vale, um, which is kind of annoying in terms of card advantage, or I can get rid of Liliana of the Last Hope, which is getting dangerously close to um, her ults, which I cannot beat. Um, if I remember right... I think I get rid of Liliana the Last Hope, just because her ult is nigh unbeatable as a control deck. Um, but I could, I could respect Bitter Blossom as a choice as well. So um, I honestly don't remember, and I think either of those choices is viable. I don't think killing Lilia, Liliana the Veil, who just down ticked, is correct. I think that killing one of those two is is more correct. I would wager that killing Liliana the Last Hope. I don't know, it's tough, because I, I don't really have a lot of ability to pressure. I mean, I need to see what I draw off of Jace, I guess. Now, it's notable that I could have drawn seven cards here. But again, you know, the fear is that with eight cards left in my deck, I don't have a super fast way of winning the game. Um... Jace the Mind Sculptor, though, is really nice. Uh, I get to bounce a creature, fog the other creature, so now I don't care as much about Bitter Blossom. Um, so now I can exile the Liliana of Last Hope. So that little bit of information went a long way. Um, of just using coercive portal mode of Jace Wielder of Mysteries. Um, 
Now I could theoretically attack, yeah, but I just I need to fog because of the Blood Forge Battle Axe. So that's where you know equipment becomes super relevant is whenever um, you know it's basically controlling the game such that I can't just let the one one be a one one because I need to. Uh, remove it from combat so it doesn't just kill outright any of my planeswalkers, which I don't want. And I understand that, that seems really weird, right? My opponent could either ult it or utilize their graveyard more effectively. Granted, there are only at 14 cards left in their deck, but you know, there's a lot that goes into um, that consideration of like why do this. And I, I think that that play made a lot of sense in terms of my opponents at 14 life, there are 14 cards left in the library. I'm at 18 life with 15 cards left in my library. So I'm winning in both of those resource fronts. My opponent is obviously doing more to pressure my life total, um, but I should be able to control that given what's in my hand and on my board. Or mostly what's on the board. My, my island isn't really doing a lot. Um, but my, uh, my Gideon and Jace are doing a lot. So there's that. Jace is going to be able to dig me to something else, and the other Jace should be able to kind of stabilize. That's what, my, what I'm thinking. That's my thought process, right? Like, I can just dig to the other Jace, play the other Jace, depending. My opponent drew a uh, Bearer of Silence, which is a fine, just 2 1 flyer. Um, and they're casting their Eternal Taskmaster, which, by the way, cannot block. So, and that's relevant in that um, I could potentially attack as Liliana force a block and bounce the other token if I wanted to. And I think that that line makes sense, although I don't think I take it, if I remember right. Looking back on it, that may have been a more optimal line. Just bounce the uh, equip token, try to attack into Liliana, force them to block. Um, but then I have the issue of the Eternal Taskmaster can be equipped and potentially kill one of my planeswalkers. It would attack for six because he's got two Bloodforge Battle Axes. So yeah, he could just outright kill Gideon if he wanted to. Um, and that's not ideal. So there is a world where that's incorrect. And I mean, it could play the Ancestral Blade and just chump block the Eternal Taskmaster. And that could be correct here. But I went for uh, Jace Zero, which is both the greedier and safer line <laughs> at the same time. Uh, I'm just going to put back the land and the uh, the blade, and then cast Shimmer of the Possibility. Shimmer of the Possibility could potentially, potentially find me a Wrath, which would allow me to also just attack with Gideon. And I think that's kind of my game plan. I don't know what I see in these top four cards. If I remember right, one of them is Elspeth, and I think that that's what my play is this turn. I was correct. So here I'm going to play the Elspeth instead of playing Jace, which should be fine. Um, she's much more uh, tempo positive. She's going to allow me to um, basically just stabilize in a way that Jace couldn't do. I mean, Jace could potentially win me the game, but so can Elspeth, and she gives me a lot more board presence. Um, so yeah. Pretty, I, I love this card. I think it's really powerful. It could be on the verge of potentially too powerful for this environment in that it's, um, one, very polar against control. It's really hard for control to answer this card. Um, and two, uh, it all three of its modes are relevant a lot of the time, right? Every single one of these is good in a variety of decks. She's a card like Brightling that's good in every deck um, that can play her while also being um, particularly good against control. So um, there is all that to consider. Right, so you drew Mur Murderous Rider. Murderous Rider. I had a tough time saying that there. Um, which can kill any one of my Planeswalkers. Uh, it's unsure what he's going to kill. He's probably pretty certain that I put the Jace into my hand when I, uh, when I Jaced, when I Jace zeroed. 
So he is going to uptick Liliana probably. He'll probably kill Jace, uptick Liliana, take away my card advantage, and so now I have to like play to the board every turn. Um, which kind of sucks, but I mean, Elspeth should be able to carry me. It's kind of my thought process here. He doesn't even murder Strider, actually, he just attacks, which is interesting. I would have wanted to murder Strider and then uptick Liliana. Oh, that's a great problem. Alright. Then we can also cast Order of Midnight. Because he doesn't really have a way of getting back that Murder Strider. I don't like that play. I think that's a game-losing play there. Um, he could have taken out Gideon, which is a huge force in this game right now, and he didn't, which I think was just blatantly incorrect. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to, on my turn, I think what I do is I can attack with Gideon if I want to, uh, but maybe that's wrong. I should probably fog one of the fairy rogues, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, yeah, just attack, because if, if he wants to try to attack my Gideon to death, I should be able to just win with this Finale of Glory that I drew. Finale of Glory is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 14 points of damage, so I'm, like, not that worried about um, his, like, if he's attacking Gideon, like, if he attacks my face, I don't care right now. I have ability to gain life with Elspeth, and I have this emblem out, so he can't really kill me. Um, even if he tried. So what I'll do instead is just attack both my guys. If he wants to trade one of his fairy rogue tokens for my 1-1, one -one, that's fine. I would much prefer that. Um, since they have flying and, and get around my uh, finale of glory. But yeah, I'm trying to take out Liliana here because... Uh, She's getting close to ult, and the ult could win the game, which I don't want. Uh, but also forces my opponent to block, which means that I have an accelerated chance of being able to get in for lethal damage next turn because he'll have less blockers. Um, that was kind of my mentality with that attack. I'm having lag issues on this game, which is why some of my turns take so long. Um, because quick time take, took up so much energy along with trying to like stay online and interact with an opponent. So anyway, uh, so 14 points of damage, seven tokens. Finale of Glory is really good, and I'm gonna make two more tokens with Elspeth. So then my goal next turn is to double pump. Uh, so I'll pump two things to kill off Elspeth and then pump two more things. And if he wants to kill Elspeth now, then I just have to... That means he's taking things out of combat. Uh, so I don't really care. <laughs> you know, he's going to he's gonna force a sacrifice with Liliana. I'm going to sacrifice one of the soldiers. These things have vigilance too. Jesus, that's so good. Sorry for the uh, screamies. Oh, I'm on replay mode. I can just... Pause. All right, sick. He's mostly away. Um, anyway, yeah. So my opponent upticks here, which is weird. Like, does he think he's gonna survive through his turn? I don't think he will. Don't think it's gonna happen, friendo. Yeah, I don't think he's gone through the math. Oh, sorry. I guess I can't show two things at once, huh? I don't think my opponent's gone through the math. Uh, he needs a lot. <laughs> like at this point, you know, the game is won, right? I've got an insane board. I've got Gideon with an emblem out, and my opponent can't currently kill it. And even if he did, I'm still at 18 life. And my opponent's at 11. And that's not where you want to be. You don't want to have less life than your opponent as the aggressor against control. You're just not winning that game most of the time. 
that's the case. So my opponents, oh god. So my opponents move into combat and they choose to attack, which seems crazy to me. What are they paying mana for? Oh, they're gonna reanimate something. Ophiomancer. Alright, that still doesn't do it. Um. Or they just bring it, it goes to their hand. Yeah, that's pretty slow. I'm thinking about this card. Um, we've had some discussions about it, and like, you know, is it good enough? I think that was a situation where he could have gotten back Murder Strider. I think that not casting the Murder Strider was like a game ending mistake, though. Like, leaving the Gideon around was just like awful. So, but I drew uh, another Prison Realm, so now I can just get rid of the Liliana uh, if I wanted to, and I do want to, just, just to like assert my dominance more. So you exile the Liliana, you pump the 1-1s, one and then you pump two of the knights, and you swing in for eight, right? Eight plus four, twelve plus two, four, six, eight, ten, twenty-two. So you swing for twenty-two damage. Yeah, there's just no way. There's no way my opponent has. He's got four blockers. He can block the twelve, and then he takes... Uh, is that 15 or something like that? 14? 12? No, it's 10. It's late. <laughs> I was thinking about... Um, is it really only 10? No, it's 10 plus 4. Yeah, it's 14. I miscounted the first time. So it should have been 8 plus 4, 12, plus 10, 22, plus 4, uh, 26. Yeah. So... 26 damage here, and he can only block uh, 12 of it. So, second math is correct. Yeah, so, um, anyway, uh, unfortunately we were unable to get a round 2, in part because our round 1 took so long, which was in part because I was control, and in part because I was... Um, okay, now that that was informative, actually. So my opponent drew a couple more cards, and I saw a damnation in there. So he's very strongly in the range then. Right, like there's no way that uh, aggro is playing um, damnation, so I, I think I need to relabel this as mid range, which is ultimately going to be uh, more informative because now watching back the replay, I, I get more information. It seemed like aggro to me. It seemed like uh, aggro that just boarded into mid range, which could still be true, but I don't think that damnation makes the cut into any aggro main deck, especially against control. Like, I don't... You're just, like, trying to beat secure... Um, not secure to waste. Um, finale of Glory? That doesn't make any sense, right? So, um... Yeah, I think that actually we don't really need an end of... Uh, an end of game review here. Um, because I got to talk so much about my opponent's deck. I got to talk so much about my deck. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this video, and uh, thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.